Friends, beloved of God, uh, always an honor and a joy to be with you, uh, even in a snow. And I'm Canadian, don't worry. So I understand the snow's not going to kill us. Uh, but uh, we will endure, right? Amen? Build snowmen later on. Okay. Uh, I get to talk about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And actually, just the fact that I get to talk about Jesus is such an honor and a privilege for me. Uh, I can literally not get enough of that. Uh, Jesus continues to completely blow my mind. And so I want to have a look at this scripture and then just talk about some ways in which this scripture has been blowing my mind and changing my life and inviting me into a real intentional posture of discipleship in the world. And maybe uh, some of that will be meaningful to you. So John chapter 13, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He loved his disciples during his ministry on earth and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, "'Lord, are you going to wash my feet?' Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, a person who is bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That's what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? That's maybe one of the best questions ever, Jesus asking the disciples. I feel like Jesus asking the disciples then and Jesus asking the disciples now. Do you understand what I was doing? You know, in Ephesians, Paul prays for the believers that are gathering there, and he says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened to understand. (laughs) Isn't that a beautiful phrase? I pray that the eyes of your heart, so like something deep inside your own spirit would be open, would be enlightened, would revelation would come on the inside of us so that we could understand what it is that Jesus is doing. In Ephesians 3.18, the apostle Paul goes on and he prays for the believers. He said, I pray that you would have power in your inner being so that you could grasp together with all the saints just how wide and high and like long is the love of God and the love that actually surpasses sort of the knowledge of our brain. I pray right now. I wonder if we could just pray right now, just like the apostle Paul for us, that we might understand. Pray with me. So Holy Spirit, we're asking right now that you would come and you would give us the understanding in our hearts of what it is that you are doing, what it is that you've done and what it is that you're doing still. Would you come and illuminate your word, illuminate Jesus so that we could follow with freedom, I pray. Amen. Amen. Do you understand what it is that I'm doing? Yeah, I was reminded, I have a friend, uh, Sandra, and she was serving in a church, and she kind of felt like she was on to her next challenge. She's a, a little bit, you know, missionally minded. She wanted to kind of go somewhere overseas or do something uh, with refugees or something like that. So she was praying. She was saying, like, God, where do you want me to go next? And she heard very clearly from the Lord in her spirit, she heard nowhere, <laughs> So she was like, oh, okay, fine, I'll just stay here then, and I'll just, I'll, I'll just stay where I am. And, and uh, she resolved in her heart to just try to do whatever it is that God told her to do, to just do that. And then that evening, she was watching the news, and on the news, there was a report from the largest refugee camp in Africa, and the journalist was outside of the camp and was saying, you know, this is the camp where I'm at, and, and said the African name, and then said, this name loosely translated means nowhere. 
And Sandra's like, oh, there's a nowhere, <laughs> right? Like, I'm going to go to nobody nowhere, and that's a place, that's a people. Like, what is happening? I feel like on so many levels, whenever you uh, look into the scriptures and wherever you look into the life of Jesus, there's so many levels that Jesus is speaking to. When he, when he says, do you understand what I'm doing? He doesn't just mean on like one level, do you understand? But like, do you understand? Do you understand? Do you understand? That's why even rereading the gospels and rereading John and relooking at Jesus. It's like blow your mind what Jesus is doing. Like in this story, let me just give you a couple of things that, that strike me in the passage of scripture of what Jesus is doing in this passage of scripture. First of all, what he's doing spiritually. I mean, for generations up until Jesus, the people were trying to get to God. People were doing everything they could to appease the God or, or to, to bribe God or to try to make it possible to do good works, to try to work their way towards God. And when Jesus comes, Jesus answers this incredible question at the heart of humanity, which is like, how do we connect to a God? How do we connect to this God, to Yahweh, to the God? How do we do it? And Jesus answers spiritually one more time with this incarnational, powerful truth truth, that we serve a God who has left heaven to actually dwell among the earth to reach us. That no longer do we have to try to do whatever it is that we have to do to try to appease or to connect with God, that God has come for us. The scripture says Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world, that Jesus came in order to seek and to save those who were lost, that Jesus comes to us. That's a Powerful truth. And actually in the Gospel of John, in this passage of scripture, John's using the language when Jesus takes off his robe and takes up the servant's towel, the same language that he used when he took off heaven and put on humanity, the incarnation, the spiritual truth that God is with us, God is for us, God has come to save us. <laughs> That's a pretty big deal going on just uh, by washing his disciples' feet. What Jesus is doing is emotional too. It's radical inclusion. It's hospitality with no bounds. You understand that Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, but he's washing all of the disciples' feet. In other words, he's not washing the worthy disciples' feet. <laughs> he's washing every disciple's feet, including the feet of Judas. Including the feet of Judas. But the scripture tells us that Judas already had said in his heart to betray Jesus, and Jesus knew it and washed his feet. Jesus was doing something emotionally, doing something caring for the disciples, loving the disciples, serving the disciples, every single disciple, regardless of what it was they were going to do or not do, he was loving them emotionally. Jesus was doing something socially. You think about this, uh, Jesus is deconstructing hierarchy forever. <laughs> I mean, this, there is no way to really understand this completely, I think, even in our world today. Jesus has gone on the inside of a caste system of his day, and he's imploded it with this action. Jesus is deconstructed, racial, gender. I mean, Galatians puts it best. Paul says, you know, in Christ, there is now no longer slave or free or, or, or Jew or Gentile or woman or men. He's deconstructed the hierarchical ideas that keep us separated. We know this because just a chapter before, Jesus has received the worship of a woman. You've already, you've done that, and that which is like scandalous on so many levels. And, and, and now in this passage of scripture, Jesus is now assuming the role of the scandal. <laughs> Jesus is being scandalizing the disciples with his ability to go as low as he possibly can. As a matter of fact, this kind of work that Jesus is doing, the washing of the feet, is not only reserved for just a servant, it's reserved for a Gentile servant. If there's a pecking order in that society, at the lowest of the lowest of the pecking order is a Gentile servant. And Jesus is taking that role on. That's why Peter's just like, no, 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 this is not happening. We're talking about a culture where rabbis would get up in the morning and pray this prayer. Thank you, God, I was not born a Gentile or a slave or a woman. Jesus is literally Gentile, slave, woman. <laughs> Let's deconstruct it all. What kind of a world would that be? What kind of a world would it be if, like Jesus, we entered in, in, in to the very fabric of our world and deconstructed it? You know, later on in Philemon, when Paul sends Onesimus, a runaway slave, back to his master, and in that context, the master would have killed the slave, Paul sends him in his name. He says, I want you to greet Onesimus, not as a runaway slave, but as a brother. And what happens if you treat a runaway slave not as a slave, but as a brother? 
brother. You deconstruct slavery. There's no way to do that anymore. But Paul goes even further than that. He says, not only do I want you to greet him as a brother, I want you to greet him as though it was me coming. I want you to greet him with an apostle's blessing. What? What is happening? Do you understand what I'm doing? Jesus asked. I don't know. I say it's blowing my mind spiritually. It's blowing my mind emotionally, the care Jesus has. It's blowing my mind socially. And here's something really key. It's blowing my mind physically. Jesus actually takes all that truth All that amazing truth, that esoteric truth, that like incredible spiritual theology, that like phenomenal thing of the incarnation, he takes all that spiritual super truth and he incarnates it, he embodies it in a physical act. In other words, it's a faith in real life. He washes their feet like real feet. It's not a euphemism. It's not like some spiritual idea. It's a real thing. It really happens. It's for real life. Jesus embodies faith in his physical self and in physical acts that transcend our everyday lives. I mean, that's just a few. There's some more things, but I'm not going to bore you with the details, right? Can I just say, blow your mind, right? I mean, blow your mind what Jesus is doing. And so then the question becomes, how does he do it? The question is, how does he do this? And this is where I really, I think it's important for us because what happens is sometimes we romanticize an act like this. Sometimes we romanticize this servanthood. And we forget that actually those acts don't happen just miraculously, you know, just by accident, like, whoops, I walked into servanthood, you know. There's actually a thing, there's a preparation, there's a process that gets us to bear acts. There's a process that gets us there. And I think Jesus has demonstrated this in this one act and how he got to this place of radical servanthood, how he got to this place of action that is so beautiful and so ushers in the kingdom of God. And I want to have a, a look at that. I know in my own life, it was servanthood that introduced me to Jesus. I was, um, I was lost. You know, I, I was a juvenile delinquent. I was estranged from my family. I was addicted to drugs. I was in a jail cell. I had for, you know, arrested for the umpteenth time and now looking at some really serious uh, problems. And I was dead not only to the world on the outside, but I was dead in my own life. I was numb, not only from drugs, but just from pain. And um, I remember being in this holding cell in the basement of the Toronto City Hall waiting for a a remand appointment. And uh, I I saw the Salvation Army lady. Her her name was Joyce Ellery. She actually was quite a high-ranking official at the headquarters. And I don't know what was happening, but she was coming to visit me on her lunch break. (laughs) I remember actually seeing her coming and thinking to myself, oh, brother, the Salvation Army because I had some experience trying to get rid of the Salvation Army in my life. And, uh, and I remember thinking, I just, oh man, like here comes the lecture, like I don't want, you know, like I should know better and what am I doing? And just like religious people are so irritating and I was pretty convinced at this point that God was, you know, my, not my friend, that I was an enemy of God and that actually he was, if not fully angry with me for good measure, he was at least disappointed in me, which is almost worse. And I remember her coming into my cell. You know, I don't know how she got in there. She's wearing her super suit, you know, Salvation Army uniform. And, and so she entered into the cell and I, and I braced myself, you know, just I was like, I hardened myself if I could get any harder. And she just came in and she wrapped her arms around me and she whispered in my ear, I love you. And then she handed me a lawyer's card, which I think was a practical version of salvation. But... And I remember I didn't hug her back. As a matter of fact, when she was leaving the cell, you know, far from a romantic servanthood experience, I shouted out after her, you didn't even bring me a smoke, I said. (laughs) Take that, how about some gratitude? And the door clung behind her, you know, just slammed shut and I was alone in the cell and that's when Jesus showed up in the exact same way. See, Jesus showed up. I can't really describe this to you uh, sufficiently. I wish I could. I wish I could describe it to myself sufficiently. But Jesus showed up and did the exact same thing that Joyce Ellery had done. He wrapped his arms around me and he whispered in my ear, I love you. And the love of Jesus, the presence of love, the absence of judgment, the presence of mercy and grace and kindness in a place where nobody else was or nobody else could see with implications nobody else could possibly ever even think or possibly imagine. Here was Jesus unlocking me on the inside, waking me up to new life. And how did that 
happen. Well, it's a miracle. Of course it's a miracle. It's Jesus coming for the lost. It's Jesus' relentless pursuit of love for you too. He will not give up on you. It is a conspiracy. (laughs) It is. He's after you. It's true. Be as paranoid as you can possibly be. He will not relent until he's found you. But how did he find me? What unlocked the door of my heart? Servanthood. Why did Joyce Ellery come visit me that day? Why did she come in and demonstrate the radical inclusion, the spiritual, the emotional, the social, the physical act of servanthood? Why? To enter in to the kingdom of God for the purpose of unlocking captives everywhere for me. Thank God I know some servants in my life. Thank God somebody was a servant to me. This is this radical act. And how did she get to that place Certainly there was not much to be gained. (laughs) Certainly there was not a lot of gratitude. Certainly there was not a lot of emotional warm fuzzies going on that day in her servanthood. But there was eternal implications. I'm so thankful that she followed Jesus and embodied her faith. I'm so thankful that she listened and obeyed. I'm so thankful that she did the nitty gritty detail of obedience of what God told her to do. I'm so thankful that she was servant hearted and that I can follow in her steps as she follows in Jesus' steps. And this is the great invitation. I pray that my heart and my mind would fully understand and comprehend how deep and wide is the love of God. So how does he do it? I'm gonna lead us through a couple of steps. The first step is this. I want you to put your hand over your heart, and I want you to say, check your motive. Actually, say this. Check your motivation. (laughs) Say it again. Check your motivation. Turn to someone beside you and say, check your motivation. (laughs) Yeah, this is love. This is God's motive is love. That's his full motivation. He's motivated by love. If you want to get to a place where loving, humble, kingdom-based action is your everyday life, you have to check your motivation. You have to check your motivation. And this isn't like a, you must check your motivation. This is like a check it. Because love is a force that can change everything, including what happens to you. Love is a means by which you can unlock the kind of servanthood that has no agenda, which is so powerful. The kind of servanthood, the kind of love that's so unconditional that it loves even the Judases among us without any uh, need for Judas to change his behavior. It's an unconditional, unrelentless love. Check your motivation. Do you have that love? Uh, here's step number two, and we're going to come back to love because I'm never going to leave love, right? We're coming back all the time to love. But here's step number two. I want you to just sort of stomp your foot and plant it down. And I want you to say this, fix your foundation. Yeah, so what's the first thing you should do? And the second thing you should do? Fix your foundation. Now listen, this is really important from the text. So before Jesus gets to washing the disciples' feet, he he checks his motivation. Listen to this. He says to God in verse 1, he loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Now, it doesn't say the very end in the scripture there, like in the original text. It doesn't say the very end as though the end of time. It says the very end until it's complete, which means he's never going to stop loving them until love is made complete. He's never going to stop loving them. Jesus' motivation was not some kind of action. It was not some kind of change. It was love and pure love is his motivation. God is love and love is God. And if you know love, then you know God. And if you don't know love, then you don't know God. Check your motivation. And then Jesus goes on, it says this, it was time for the supper, and he already knew about Simon. And then listen to this, verse three, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God, so he got up from the table. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority. In other words, Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew who he was. Now, this is fixing your foundation is getting to a place of humility. And true humility, you may have heard this before, but true humility, the best definition I know, is agreeing with God about who you are. It's knowing who you are. This frees you from having to serve out of some sense of duty. It also frees you from having to serve out of some sense of like, I I have to prove something. You can get rid of all the agendas if you deal with your insecurity. Fix your foundation. It'll also save you from serving out of some sense of ego. 
It'll also serve you out of serving with some sense of agenda. See, fix your foundation. Your foundation that needs to be fixed is who you are. Now, see, we know Jesus, not only in this passage of Scripture, knows who he is. The fact that he knows who he is is what liberates him to take off what other people thought of him. To take off dignity or to take off fear or to take off social status or to take off his privilege or to take off whatever it is, maybe even his prejudice. He can take it off because he knows who he is. He's the son of God. He is chosen. He is loved. He is a purpose. He is a fullness of Christ. Now, when did Jesus really know that? You know, when Jesus really knew that is not at the end of his life or at the end of his ministry. It's at the beginning. Before Jesus does one thing, before Jesus heals one person, before Jesus goes anywhere, he gets baptized by John the the, the Baptist. He gets baptized by John the Baptist. I said that right? Yeah. And then he comes out of the baptism. And do you remember what happens? The Holy Spirit descends like a dove and a voice of the Father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, the delight of my life. Before Jesus did a single thing, he knew who he was. Fix your foundation. If you want loving and humble and kingdom-based action in your life, if you want to live a servanthood life, deal with your foundation. Where is there insecurity? Where is there fear? Where is there ego? You deal with it. Ask God to come in and remind you of who you are, irrespective of what other people do. Who are you? And serve out of that full place. Serve out of that sure place. Serve out of that healed place. Serve out of that whole place. And you'll find a servanthood that will radically change the world. You got it? The first thing to do? Check your motivation. And the second thing? Fix your foundation. And here's number three. Set your direction. You want to say it? Set your direction. No, you have to do it. Ready? Set your direction. Yeah, it makes me feel like I'm at an airport. Do it again. Set your direction. Right. You know, one of the most powerful, oh, this is this part three of the, verse three, the second part, it says, because Jesus knew where he'd come from and he knew where he was going. Where is he going? Where's Jesus going? Where's Jesus headed? Yeah, he's headed to the cross. I mean, if you keep reading this passage of scripture, which I'm sure you're doing all together, you keep reading this passage of scripture, later on he says, like, I could, I could ask God to change it, but why would I? I'm, I'm headed to the cross so that I can make a way where there is no way, so that I can right the wrongs in the world, so I can usher in God's plan of redemption for the whole world. I've got something. And Hebrews said, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Right? I mean, this is like, this is the plan. Jesus had his face directed to the cross, to the job that he needed to do for God's kingdom to come. This is how he taught the disciples to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in, king, as it is in heaven. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing. Your kingdom come. His direction is set. He's not looking for Roman approval. He doesn't need it. He's not looking for Jewish religious, oh, way to go, Jesus. That was a good move. You know, he's not looking for public approvals or Twitter ratings or any of those things, he couldn't care less. His eyes are set on the kingdom of God. His direction is set on God's kingdom come. <laughs> and what that produces, when you have fixed, checked your motivation, it produces love. And when you fix your foundation, it creates a humility. And when you set your direction, it focuses, it focuses you on God's kingdom come. And what that produces in your life is servant action. It produces action about servanthood. It produces a serving that literally breaks open the kingdom of God. You know, I, I ran a ministry for many years on the streets of a, a town and a city in Canada, and it was to women who were um, surviving through sex work, through sexual exploitation. And this ministry, it was kind of a miracle. I was praying about it, and God provided this van and like a little bit of funding to get it up. And and we started running it, just volunteers. It was a real skeleton situation. We didn't have enough resources really to do what it is that I had planned to do. And I remember always saying to the Lord, like, I need money. <laughs> We are saying to the Lord, and I was in a town that was really quite wealthy. It's kind of where the, the Texas of the north is where all the oil comes from in Canada. And there's wealth everywhere. And I'd be speaking at these Christian conferences. And it seemed like there was lots of money for light and sound. And I couldn't figure out, like, why isn't there money for, like, street outreach? You know, like, where's the money? And I was, like, turning into a Jerry Maguire movie, you know. I'm like, where's the money? Show me the money, you know. And God kept saying to me, you don't need money. And I'd be like, what do you know? 
Well, I didn't say that, you know, but I meant it. And so, and I'd be like, I need money, you know, because I wanted to do more professional things. Like I wanted to set up this thing and I had these dreams of like how this would work. And also we all know that if you get a paid professional, it gets done better, right? (laughs) Well, maybe in the world. But then God was gonna school me in the kingdom. He's gonna school me in the kingdom because this is what how I was on. So what happened was instead of money, God kept sending people from all different churches, 14 different churches, 280 volunteers, teams of women would come down into this downtown inner city and they would serve from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning. They would serve at night just loving these women. Just they get on this van, this kind of RV, we create a living room and they give them a cup of coffee and they'd say, hey, like, is there anything we can do? We'd have some clothes there, but also we'd try to get them a drive someplace safe or warm. If they wanted to go to treatment, if we could take them to the hospital, if we could to take them to a safe shelter. We're trying to get them off the street. We're trying to intervene. We're trying to have intervention, you know, trying to serve, trying to love, or trying to be present in the darkness. And I was there one night where there's this suburban group from a church, you know, fairly new at this work, you know, a little bit like wide-eyed, if you know what I mean, like, Whoa! and I remember that the night it, it happened, I was sitting there with this team, and this woman gets on the van, and she's had a rough night, and she's not in a good place, and she's uh, having an altercation with another woman, and it's a little bit tense, and this this one volunteer says, oh, you know, maybe we could stop this fighting, you know, <laughs> because, uh, you know, this is a peaceful place. I just ask you to respect, you know, the, the inside of this peace, you know. And this woman looks at her and just is like, oh, yeah. She's like, but you don't mind because if I wasn't here on the street, you wouldn't even have a job. <laughs> and this woman looks at her like, oh, oh, she says, oh, you think I get paid. <laughs> And the woman goes, yeah, you get paid. And if I wasn't here, you wouldn't get paid. The woman says to this girl, oh, honey, I don't get paid. I'm just a volunteer. The girl goes, why the blank would you be here at one o'clock in the morning if you're not getting paid? It was like, do you understand what I'm doing? The volunteer looks at this girl and says, I guess, I guess it's because I love you. Boom, tears, peace, Jesus, radical act of servanthood from a place of love, from a place of humility, from a a direction of God's kingdom come, comes these radical acts of servanthood. And I felt like God reminded me, do you see what I'm doing? This is not about throwing money at a problem. This is not about, you know, money is half the problem when it comes to sex survival. This is not about power. This is about love, which is a different kind of power. It's an inside out power. This is about a social deconstruct, man. This is about God's kingdom breaking into the world. Don't you want to be a part of that kingdom come? And that will be done. And that's why Jesus turns to the disciples when he's done this radical act. And he says, see what I've just done? Do that. Do that. Do you see what I've just done? Do that. Visit the juvenile delinquent. Go ahead, whether they're grateful or not. Serve wherever you can find to serve, not because you have to prove something, not because you need to, not because you even want them to change. Just check your motivation. Just fix your foundation. Just set your direction and you will find your life beginning to look like Jesus in radical servanthood. And that radical servanthood is the best chance we have at bringing God's kingdom come in this world. I want to live like that. Sometimes I ask myself though, like, how? How do you fix your motivation and your foundation and set your direction? How how do I do that? What if it's not love? You know, like when I check my heart sometimes and I I, I say like, is my motivation the kind of love, like Paul spelled it out just in case we had any doubts about what love looked like, right? So you can either hear it at a wedding or you can hear it here, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13 where it says love is patient and love is kind and love does not envy and it does not boast. It doesn't delight in someone else's wrong and it keeps no record, right? That love is just, and you're just like, really? (laughs) Ah, how do I do that? And this is the other thing that's so radical about this passage of scripture. See, Peter's like, no, 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 no. I can't do this. This is blowing my mind. Like, this is wrecking my life. Like, I can't have this happening. And Jesus says, you have to. You have to. And why do you have to? Can I tell you, it's because you can't give 
what you don't receive. You can't give what you don't receive. In other words, when I check my motivation and I find myself lacking in love, which is quite often, by the way, this is like a daily check, check your motivation. It's a daily check. And this is what Jesus says, every day maybe you need your feet washed. Not your whole body, it's not your salvation that's in question, your love, the purpose of God for your life is set. Jesus will, it's, he's gonna love you to the very end until it's all complete, no matter what, he loves you. But this is a check your motivation. This is like, I got some dust on my feet, some mud from this world. I have some value that's still sticking to me from the world in which I live, from a status climb, from an excess idea, from this like Herculean pursuit of being better than everybody else check my motivation and when I find myself lacking in love when I'm not patient and when I'm not kind and when I'm not uh, willing to like let go of wrongs that have happened when I feel bitterness and resentment growing in me I have to receive I have to receive before I can give it. I have to say to Jesus, please, Jesus, as hard as this is for me, would you remind me again? Would you pour your love into me again? Would you bring your love into my life again? Would you remind me that you love me no matter what, whether this works or whether it doesn't work, whether I'm off or whether I'm on, whether I feel goosebumps tonight or whether it falls flat on my face, would you please heal my heart? Would you pour your love into me so I can freely give what I have freely received? This is the same. This is the same with every step, right? We check our motivation. We receive the love that we need to give out. We cannot. It's a supernatural love, people. Nobody's got that love. Nobody has that love except Jesus. Jesus is perfect love, and he can pour that love into you. And you simply, like Jesus said to the disciples, like modus operandi number one, freely you have received, now freely give. One beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That's what happens in radical servanthood. When I'm insecure or when I'm egotistical and proud, I come to God and I say, oh God, remind me. Set my feet upon a rock. Remind me of who I am and who says so. Remind me to listen to your voice today that says, you're my daughter, Danielle. I love you. I'm proud of you. I made you. You're good. Right now, before you do a single thing, success or failure doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You are who you are because I say so. You're my child and that's enough. And I get my foundation fixed on the rock of Christ. And finally, I, I, I set my direction. What am I aiming for? Where do I come from and where am I going? I'm not, I don't care about what Rome's building. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. I can set my direction. What is my direction? Where am I going? I am going to the kingdom of God. I'm headed to the kingdom of God. You know, Black History Month has been such a gift to me. I, I am so in awe of so many incredible examples of disciples from the black community. Wow, are we indebted. Well, one story I was reminded of when I was flying into Chicago, I remember Martin Luther King Jr., you know, when the, the Black Panther movement was rising in its popularity, even here in Chicago, and he met with the leaders because of the violence, and he said to them, I don't understand. Why are you using violence? We're using nonviolence, and it's working so much better. It's such a better model. Like, please, could you not just help us spread the nonviolent movement? And the Black Panther said to Martin Luther King, you just don't understand. <laughs> You don't understand what it's like to be in a place where you have an illusion of freedom, but no freedom. They said, it's so infuriating. They said that to Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> I don't know if I was Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, this is after he won a Nobel Peace Prize. This is like when he's talking to presidents on the phone. Like, this is when he's at the height of his popularity. I mean, they said that to Martin Luther King Jr. If they had said that, if I was Martin Luther King Jr., I'd be like, what? <laughs> Shut up. Of course I understand. Like, you know who you're talking to? You know, like, I'd be all, like, offended and I'd be all proudful, but that's because I'm basic. But you know what Martin Luther King Jr. does, this post-Noble Peace Prize, this post-civil rights movement and its height, he moves to Chicago for three days a week into a housing estate in this community to try to fully understand. What would motivate him to do that? Love. Love. 
What would make him, <laughs> what would found that man to do an act like that? Security. There's no insecurity there. Humility. I am a brother. I am a man knowing who I am, knowing who God has made him to be. Not what the Nobel Peace Prize people think. Not what the president of America thinks. But his fellow community what, what would, what, why would he do that? Because his eyes were fixed. His direction was set on ushering in a kingdom of God, of freedom, of hope, of love, of truth. I mean, I, I want to live like that with radical acts of servanthood coming out of a place and a posture that looks a lot like Jesus. Don't you? I do. Let me pray for you. Yeah, amen. God grant it. God, we thank you so much for all the heroes of the faith. We thank you so much, mostly, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you for your amazing life. Thank you that you showed up and you broke open the possibility of us connecting with God. Thank you, God, for your son. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the invitation to follow you in this radical example of servanthood. Would you please check our motivation? Would you pour your love into us, God? Would you fix the foundations of our life wherever there are cracks of insecurity, wherever there is the stench of ego, God, would you come? Would you soothe us and secure us and settle us in who you say we are? And help us to stand firm in that place. And God, I pray for this church. I pray that you would set their direction on your kingdom come. On your kingdom come. On your will be done. To know where we've come from and to know where we're headed. Heaven on earth, we pray in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Do you ever just go to church and the speaker is speaking and you just think, man, how does she know what's going on in my life? That was me this morning. Did anybody else need that word this morning? Come on, can we just say thank you so much to Danielle Strickland again? So good. Wow, so good, so good. Hey, um, we wanna pray for you if you need some prayer. We actually have a prayer room just through the lobby. And in a couple of weeks, it's gonna be baptism weekend here at Willow, we get so excited about that here. And if you've not been baptized yet and you are just interested, we're, we're gonna have an informational meeting right here. You can go ahead and leave your kids in Promised Land if you have some kids there. We want you just to come, even if you're just curious about baptism, right here, right after service. Hey, let me bless you as we go. Willow Creek Community Church, let us be a humble people. Let us be a people that serve with love as the motivation. And let us be a people that remember that we are loved by Jesus Christ. God bless you guys, we'll see you guys soon.